Tick brazing can be very handy. After I've used it for the first time on the rear fender of the BMW, with absolutely no clue about the right technique, I set out to properly learn the skill of tick brazing. And after hours of practice, I'm finally ready to share with you what I've learned. In case you haven't heard much about tick brazing yet, let me quickly go over what it actually is and what the pros and the cons are before I show you what I've learned about the right technique. Tick brazing is a way of joining two pieces of metal without actually welding them. When you weld, you melt up the base material and thereby fuse the two pieces together. But with tick brazing, it's more like using glue. You only melt the filler rod on top of the joint and for certain applications, that's actually good. The main advantage for me at the moment is that I can make joints with much less heat. And that on the one hand reduces distortion, which basically just means that your pieces don't do this or this, but there's another big advantage of tick brazing that can actually come in handy for you. You can actually join two different types of metal. You can take a stainless steel plate and a carbon steel plate, tick braze those together, and because you're not melting the base material, you're not changing the chemical properties of each plate. So your stainless steel plate doesn't start to rust just because you tick braze it to a carbon steel plate, which would normally happen if you welded those two together. But with a proper tick brazing technique, you won't have that problem. What you can also do is join two pieces of material that have very, very different thicknesses. This is one millimeter thick, this is six millimeter thick. This could be 13, 15, doesn't matter. If you wanted to weld those together, you probably run into the problem that once this bottom part is actually warm enough to be welded the top part is already burnt away but with tick brazing you don't have that problem because you only need to heat up the pieces to a point where the silicon bronze melts onto them and since silicon bronze melts way earlier than steel you don't run the risk of burning away your thin base material well but now you might ask if it has so many advantages why don't you use it all the time and that's because the advantages also come with some downsides. The main one is that the joints aren't as strong as properly welded joints, where you melt the base material and the filler rod, and then all of this gets hard together and creates one solid piece. With tick brazing, it's more like gluing two pieces together. You take the two pieces, melt the filler on top of the joint, and then the filler hardens, but it doesn't penetrate the base material. That's why it isn't as strong. But you can increase the strength of the joint by actually tick brazing both sides. And I'm always doing this just because it's easier to show, but you shouldn't use tick brazing for butt joint. Only use it for filler joints, or lap joints, or or outside corner joints and if you brace both sides of these joints then you actually get a much stronger connection. However, for most parts, and especially the more cosmetic ones that don't have to withstand so much force, tick brazing is probably strong enough. This rear fender, for example, I've tick braced only on the top, and to add a little bit more strength with minimal heat input, I fuse weld at the bottom side. That's where you just take your tick torch and go over the joint without adding any filler material. And for a piece like this, tick brazing is definitely strong enough and gives you the advantage that you don't really have to worry too much about distortion. If you still want to increase the strength of your joint, I think there might be a way to do so without adding too much more heat. What I think you can do is put properly welded tags on your joint and then just brace in between. I haven't tried that, but I want to find out, so I've prepared a little test. I've prepared four little test pieces that I want to try to break apart and see how strong the joints actually are. Take brace on just one side, tick braced on both sides, tick welded tags on each end and brace in between on just one side and the same on both sides. So I guess this would be the least strong and then the rest should be pretty solid. Right, we're gonna start with the one that's tick braced on just one side. This actually breaks quite easily. Next up is the same setup, but braced on both sides. And this holds up so, so much better. Now let's see how much of a difference it actually makes if you space out properly welded tags along the joint. I'm actually surprised because it is a little bit harder to break, but it doesn't make too much of a difference. And now for good measure, the fourth one where I tagged and braced both sides. And like before with a two-sided braced one, this holds up perfectly. So this actually shows us that putting tags on just one side doesn't do too much to improve the strength, maybe a little bit. But what gives you a very solid joint is just brazing both sides of the joint. And I'm very impressed by how much 
this actually holds up. With that little test out of the way, let's move on to the right technique. Because while it's similar to TIG welding, you can keep a few little things in mind and get so, so much better results. So I've watched every tutorial out there in order to understand what the right technique is. And then I practiced, I practiced, and practiced. Here's what I've learned. Preparation is key. You want to have very, very clean parts and wire brush on every restart. For cleaning your parts, you can either use a die grinder with a grinding disc or an angle grinder with a flat disc. And once your parts are shiny, you want to wipe them with some acetone. Having clean parts is so important because the silicon bronze will only flow well on an oxidation-free surface. In that sense, tick brazing is relatively similar to soldering. But when you solder, you can use flux that removes oxides and helps the filler to flow better. With Tick brazing, you have to do all the hard work of cleaning the parts yourself. And that's also why it's so important that you properly clean your filler rod, because you don't want to introduce any contaminations in your puddle. What I normally use for that is a red stretch bright first, and then I just wipe them off with some acetone. A good practice here is that you only clean as many as you actually need for the joint that you're working on. So don't go ahead and batch clean the whole package that you have and then forget about it. Rather, just clean as many as you need for the joint that you're working on at the moment and then clean new ones as you go along. And speaking of filler rods, you definitely need to pay attention that you get the right filler rod because there are two different types of silicon bronze filler rod. One is for tick brazing and the other one is for gas brazing. And the ones for gas brazing have zinc in it and that will create a very big mess if you use them with your tick torch. So definitely double check that you get the right filler rod. What you can consider when selecting the right silicon bronze filler rod is to maybe go a size bigger than you would normally use for your welding filler rod. The advantage of going bigger with your silicon bronze filler rod is that you create a slightly bigger joint that has more area to bind to and thereby is a little bit stronger. All right, let's quickly talk about your torch setup. Basically, you can run everything the same way like you would use for TIG welding steel. But with this, since it has to be a very clean environment, you want to go with the biggest cup that you have. I unfortunately only have number 8 cups, but if you have a number 10 cup or a number 12 cup, that would be even better. Apart from that, you can run everything the same way you normally do. I have a gas lens in there and then I run 2.4 millimeter Ray tungsten, which means they are 2% serrated. Before we now get into brazing, one word of caution. Please wear a respirator. I use this one from 3M with a pancake filters and that fits perfectly perfectly underneath the welding hood. From what I've heard, unfortunately, tick brazing with silicon bronze filler rod is more harmful than your normal tick welding. So definitely wear one of these. At least I don't want to take any chances. And with that out of the way, let's jump into machine settings and see how you can find the right amps for your application. When it comes to machine settings, you can actually use AC and DC for tick brazing. If you use AC, that can help you to clean the joint a little bit more by switching polarities and thereby will result in a little bit shinier joint. But for me, it's too much of a hassle to always go through all the settings and get the settings right. But if you want to try that, your balance should be above 80% and your frequency somewhere between 100 and 150. And then finding the right amps will be the same like I explained now for DC. DC is a little bit more straightforward because you only need to find the right amps. And how you do that is you start pretty, pretty low and then work your way up in small steps. Because what you want to keep in mind is that you definitely don't want to melt the base material. So you don't want to form a puddle. And a good indication for when you've reached the right temperature is when the metal turns kind of cherry red but doesn't get liquid. That's the perfect time to introduce your filler rod because then it melts nicely to the metal and bleeds out nicely. But to find that point, you need to experiment a little bit. So what I would do is start relatively low, maybe like for two millimeter test piece, you'd start with 15 or 20 amps and then work your way up until you find the right setting for your machine and your joint. A little pointer that helped for me and my machine, and it might be completely different for yours, but it can give you a an indication of where you might end up is for the two millimeter test pieces. I used 32 amps for outside corner joints and then for lab joints and fillet joints, I used 35 amps. If you don't have time to properly let your piece cool down in between passes, you obviously need to reduce your amps slightly with like 
the next passes that then get hotter and hotter. What you also want to keep in mind is that you don't want to braise too cold because two things happen. For one, your filler rod will only make little balls and doesn't really stick to the joint. So you will have problems with it bleeding out properly. And then the second thing is that if you braise too cold or with too little amps, your piece can actually heat up more than with the proper amps because you have to stay way, way longer on that one spot just to bleed out the filler rod and then the whole piece gets hot. So you definitely want to find that sweet spot where you're just shy enough of forming a puddle, but also hot enough for the filler material to properly bleed out because that's when you get a nice strong joint. So what I would recommend you to do is to get a test piece that is similar to the joint that you are about to brace and just get the settings right on there. And if you've never tick braced before, the first thing I would do is just try to get the temperature right. Try to find the right settings for your amps. See how the filler rod behaves when the material is still too cold. See how it behaves when it's too hot. See when it forms a puddle and how the color looks just before that. So you get a feeling for your machine and how the silicon bronze behaves. Don't worry about the filler rod technique because we're gonna move on to that right now. When it comes to the technique of tick brazing, it's actually much more similar to tick welding than I thought it would be, but there are a few things that you have to do differently in order to get good results and not be super frustrated all the time. There are two different ways of introducing the filler rod. The first one is the lay wire technique where you just leave the filler rod in the joint and go over it with a torch. That works, but I don't really like it because to me it doesn't look that aesthetic. It might be my technique on that one, but dabbing the filler rod gives you a very, very nice uniform looking bead. The first thing that I've noticed is that you have to keep your torch a little bit more straight because the silicon bronze melts so fast. If you angle it too much, then the filler rod just melts right on here, creates a ball and doesn't come off anymore. And when you choose the dabbing technique, there are actually quite a few things going on at the same time. So it takes a little bit of practice to getting used to that. So the main motion looks like this. You heat the material up when it has the right temperature. You move the torch a little bit back and up over the already existing bead. You add filler rod to the part that you've just heated up and then you move your torch forward and bleed that new filler rod out. And then you repeat that back and a little bit up, introduce filler rod. The back motion is there so you don't stay on one part of the base material too long and risk creating a puddle. So you rather have your arc over the existing filler rod bead. Moving it up slightly will help you to keep your tungsten clean because what happened to me in the beginning was when I introduced the filler rod, the puddle would rise and I would get tiny bits of filler rod on my tungsten. I had to grind so, so many tungsten until I noticed, okay, I can move back and a little bit up, introduce filler rod and then bleed it out. And that way you can weld long beads without having to regrind your tungsten all the time. How I start is also a little bit different than how I start a normal TIG weld because I don't want to risk creating a puddle straight away. I actually start introducing a tiny bit of filler rod relatively early, as soon as the metal is hot enough for taking some filler rod. And then I use that little bit of filler rod to heat that area up a little bit more, but not creating a puddle. Then I dab another time on the start and then I just move forward. And you know that you have the right temperature when the filler rod that you've already applied follows the arc when you move forward. So it actually flows nicely into the new area that you heat up. And when heating up the next area, like with tick welding, you always want to have at least half of your arc on the old bead and then half of the arc on the new material so you don't move your arc completely away from the existing filler rod bead. That way you don't run the risk of creating a puddle. And then once you reach the end of your joint, you want to taper off nice and slow so you don't run the risk of creating a crater. What happens to me with my machine is that it sometimes randomly just shuts off halfway uh, through the foot pedal range. And in order to reduce the risk of creating a crater, I move back a little bit while tapering off. So if it shuts off too rapidly and I do get a crater, I get it over an existing beat and it doesn't go all the way through. Here are a few exercises that you can use to dial in your technique. The first one that I would recommend you to do is just run simple stringer beads. For that, I normally use a four millimeter thick steel plate. 
and I mark a few guidelines on there. A vertical one that goes down the center and then horizontal ones with 10 millimeters distance in between them. It definitely helps to have a few different plates at hand so you can rotate through them and let each of them cool down while you work on the next one. So I've done a ton of those and you can definitely see the progression from there. Once you have a nice understanding of the technique, you can move on to little coupons that you cut from something a little thinner to save some money, maybe two millimeter thick steel, and you can do all different joint setups like outside corner joints or fillet joints or lap joints, whatever you like to practice. And if you want to get a lot of practice in one singular practice piece, what you can do is build a little cube like this. All you have to do is get some square tubing. I used 40 by 40 millimeters with two millimeters of wall thickness. The bigger your square tube, the longer the beads that you can run. And then you just cut six of those pieces that are two centimeters wide basically and tack them together. With that you can already practice 12 fillet joints but if you also want to have 24 if I'm not mistaken outside corner joints you cut little squares that fit inside of the square tubing and that gives you four outside corner joints for each of the ends. With all of these exercises keep in mind that you want to wire brush every restart and it's particularly easy to practice that on the stringer beads because you always have the first part then you stop and then you do the second part practicing your restart but before you do the second part you want to wire brush that area so just keep that in mind because it's a good habit to develop now so you don't keep forgetting wire brushing once you do proper joints all right so the last thing that i think we need to cover is quality control basically how you can assess whether you've done good work whether you've created a good joint and let's start with the basics because there are three criteria that are true for all of the different joints and you can practice that already with your stringer beads the first criteria is the bead width. You want to create a bead that has the same width throughout. What happened to me in the beginning a lot was that I started narrow because the plate wasn't hot enough and the filler material didn't bleed out and then towards the end when the plate got hotter my bead got way wider. How you can kind of control that is by giving it more time in the beginning and then increasing your travel speed towards the end and that should give you a nice consistent width. What you also want to be consistent with is the stepping distance. So you want to have very consistent beads that are all evenly spaced out. If at some point you lose bead separation and it all becomes one line basically, that means that you got too hot and you either have to reduce your amps or you have to travel a little bit faster. And the last thing that you want to be consistent with is your bead height. And with your bead height, you also want to watch out for nicely bleeded out edges. You don't want the filler rod to build up too much and create rough edges. Even though you're not melting the base material, you want the filler material to bleed out and have a nice transition to the base material that will give you the most strength and the most appealing looking joint. So practice string of beads until you have all of those three criteria dialed in and then you move forward to the next exercises. For outside corner joints, you obviously want to have the bead run nicely along the middle and tie in well to both sides while not losing the consistency of the bead. For lap joints and fillet joints, you want to have a relatively triangular joint, so that's not too concave. And then specifically for the lap joint, you want the joint to tie in nicely to the top edge of the top plate, but it shouldn't bite away any of the top edge because we don't want to melt the base material. And then there's one last overarching thing that you can check for, which is that your finished joint should have a similar color like your unused filler rod. If you have that, that means that you cleaned your part very nicely and that you didn't pull away the filler rod too far because if you do that you can also introduce contamination. If you get gray particles or discolored joints it can mean that it maybe pulls in contaminations from the back of your joint so you have to clean both sides well or you haven't cleaned the top side properly or maybe your filler rod is dirty. So all of those things can lead to contamination and if you have a nice shiny well that looks the same color as your filler rod you have done a good job. All right, so that's all I know about tick brazing so far. I hope this video was helpful to you. I'm going to continue building the BMW now. If you want to see how I've built the rear fender and use tick brazing for that, I'm going to link you that right here. Apart from that, thank you very much for watching and I see you in the next one.